Uh, so good morning. I'm Justin Pierce. I'll be talking to you uh, today. I have a couple of presentations. We're going to be talking about geomorphology and levees. Um, so before I get going um, with the talk, I want to make a couple of points. So first of all, this is going to be, you know, very geo based, right? And so you're going to hear terms like alluvial fan, and meander scrolls and point bars and expose. For the geologists in the club, you know, hopefully this is just kind of reflect your terminology. Hopefully you've, you know, heard these terms before and you understand relatively what they mean. For the geotechnical engineers, this is probably going to be a little foreign. And I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, I'm not expecting, you know, the geotechnical engineers to come out of this couple of presentations, you know, memorizing and, and truly internalizing all these terms that we're going to go through, because it's going to be a little bit of a, a, of a fire hose blast. But I think, you know, the thing I want to emphasize is that, you know, for the geotechnical engineers, when you come away from this, it should give you talking points, things to be able to ask your geologist when you're in a risk assessment, right? So it's trying to, you know, hopefully bridge the gap so that it's not um, uh, too dichotomous between disciplines. And the second thing I wanted to point out is that geomorphology, as we've learned yesterday during our site characterization exercise, is applicable to dams. It's not just you know, unique to levees, it's applicable to dams as well, but it's very applicable to levees for a particular reason. And that's because, let me ask you guys this. So how many levee miles are in the National Levy Database? Anybody know? 100? It's about 24,000, 24,000 miles of levees. And typically these are constructed right against rivers on floodplains. And so understanding geomorphology of rivers, how rivers behave and how that leads to understanding what deposits they leave behind is critical for trying to anticipate, particularly for levees, where you might have a failure mode of under seepage, which is also called backward erosion and piping. So most of the talk is going to be trying to help you guys understand how we put this together in terms of a process framework. And then how you can take that and apply it to your levy risk assessments to try and understand your shallow stratigraphy beneath your levees to help uh, assess the potential for under seepage. We'll talk a little bit about riverine erosion later on. Um, that's something that we're not going to um, spend too much time on, but uh, geomorphology and processes of rivers is also applicable to that. So first of all, what is geomorphology, right? Basically, it's the study of the shape of the surface of the earth, right? It's the, it's the landforms that we see when we're walking around day to day. And every piece the surface of the planet can be placed into any particular geomorphic category. There's no place on Earth where you can't say, I don't know what this got here, what process made this landform, whether it's depositional or erosional. And so when you can understand, you know, at least at a high level, river processes of erosion, deposition, meandering, this sort of thing, and you couple that with an examination of the topography because the processes lead to the deposits which dictate the topography that you see on the floodplain. Uh, it can help you understand in three dimensions what the likely architecture of the shallow subsurface stratigraphy is. So when you uh, build this up, it, 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 is, um, it strongly informs your ability to assess the failure mode of under seepage. Which, you know, just as a little aside, there's like three or four main failure modes for levees. Overtopping, which we're not going to talk about today, under seepage, riverine erosion, and um, things like penetration. So, you know, this is the under seepage one is, is a pretty big one for a risk assessment for a levee. So as we heard about yesterday, one of the things that we want to try and do in the Terzaghi sort of framework is you want to start at the regional scale get an understanding at a high level of the uh, general characteristics of any particular site that you're looking at, and then move down to the site-specific scale for your characterization. And these, these typically go hand in hand. Usually if you have a regional scale characterization that's discrepant with your site-specific, you're kind of probably missing a piece or two of the puzzle. 
So one of the things that we talk about a lot is depositional environments, right? So that's the, um, the way the dirt gets put down, right? And so it makes a difference whether you're in a fast moving, high energy environment, or say a slow water moving, slack water, low energy environment. You'll get different types of deposits based on those basic principles. And so when we look, uh, the next couple of slides are gonna talk about sort of the regional scale um, geomorphology, right? So I'm gonna show you a bunch of examples from California because it has fantastic geomorphology and it also has a lot of levees along the Sacramento, San Joaquin, all these other rivers. Um, so they have great opportunities to serve as, as examples. And so these next three slides are gonna show how your geomorphology will change as you are on the same river, the Sacramento River, just moving from high in the watershed to middle in the watershed to lower in the watershed. So this slide here is showing um, Sacramento River up near Red Bluff, it's high, it's high in the watershed. It's a steep uh, gradient. So it's moving uh, coarse material and it's meandering quite a bit. As you can see on the slide, there's a lot of meanders uh, in this river, it's a coarse grain system. And uh, what happens is, is these um, uh, systems have a dep depositional environment that's high energy, so you get coarse, coarse grain material, right? Sand, gravel, cobbles, that kind of thing. So we can link together, you know, these basic processes with an anticipation of basic grain size. When you move uh, lower down in the watershed, kind of middle in the watershed, you can see the plan form of the river changes. And when the plan form of the river changes, you're getting changes in processes, right? So it's not meandering and eroding laterally as much now. It's kind of confined in its channel. And um, I had the um, main takeaway from this one is, is your, your subsurface stratigraphy is going to change as your plan form is changing. So less sand, silt, and cobbles. Sand, gravel, and cobbles, you're probably picking up more gravel, sand, and silt. And as you move a little lower in the watershed, so we're now kind of down in toward the estuary um, environment, you can see that the uh, Sacramento River is, is changing in its plan form. It's starting to branch out into several different um, uh, channels. It's what in geomorphology land we call anastomosing or anabranching. Um, the terms I don't expect you to take away, you know, but it is the main point that as these plan forms change, the processes change. Maybe it's now it's moving from an erosional state from this meandering system to more of a overbanking flooding and kind of a depositional state. It builds up what we call these natural levees along the ridges of the channel on which the levees ended up the artificial levees, flood control levees, end up getting constructed. All right, so kind of continuing that thread, uh, you can see the state of California on the left, that yellow box delineates uh, kind of the little site-specific area we're going to zoom in on in the Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta area. We're going to kind of use this as a little bit of a talking point example. So what happens is in this particular area of the, of the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, we're in a very transitional environment. Um, I skipped the previous slide because it's, it's too specific. I went to this slide because it's a little more cartoony and I thought it would help you guys kind of key into some of these points. So it's a three-dimensional block diagram and it's trying to show how um, you have river deposits. This would be the San Joaquin River has these little dark blobs of uh, abandoned oxbows that are infilled with fine grain material, flowing in kind of a sandy sort of uh, floodplain matrix, if you will. And then, and then in this particular instance, uh, you have alluvial fans that come off of the Sierra Nevada mountains and they come down towards the main river. And in the area of Stockton, uh, they have levees along these alluvial fan systems that tie into these main stem rivers. So what ends up happening is that you have um, transitional depositional environments as you move from the alluvial fans, which are, uh, have their own unique set of characteristics, across what we call these low-lying flood basins that typically are um, you know, fine-grained silts and clays, and then it ties into these um, main stem um, San Joaquin River levees. And so you get these transition areas as you're crossing 
over different depositional environments. So what happens is, is when you're in a risk assessment and you're looking at subsurface boring logs, you can get all kinds of mixtures of materials and not only within one borehole, but across various boreholes that don't seem to make sense, right? It's not some constant thickness of clay or some constant thickness of sand. You know, they kind of transition back and forth as the river moves around through geologic time and it leaves its evidence in the subsurface stratigraphy. So when you have uh, um, these types of dynamic uh, depositional environments as you're going across different um, geomorphic um, landforms, you can use these processes and principles to try and understand and put a framework around the deposits that you're seeing in the subsurface, right? And sometimes it involves a little bit of what my colleague calls geofantasy. You know, you really kind of have to, you know, use some creativity to put these things together in terms of, you know, we have X process that brings in gravel, we have Y process that brings in silt and clays. That's how these interfinger and interbed in the subsurface. And the whole point is, is that, um, you know, we want to have analyses that are informed, right? You know, the traditional way of looking at some of this is just, okay, put some stick logs up and we got GP, CLs, SMs, and they kind of, you know, pinch out here and there and here and there. And it's like, you know, I think we can do a little bit better than that. And I think we need to do a little bit better than that to show that we can take our geology, geomorphology, and geotechnical information and marry them together in a site characterization framework to come up with a model. So we're going to move a little bit more into the site-specific scale. So we're going to talk uh, quite a bit about point bores and meander scrolls um, because these have a pretty strong control on the locations of uh, where we get backward erosion and piping, uh, aka other seepage. So just a three-dimensional sort of block diagram of the various um, landforms that you get with fluvial or riverine geomorphology processes. This is just kind of a classic textbook diagram. You know, we can see we have uh, we have river moving through the floodplain, uh, various things what, what, like uh, what we call natural levees, which is where the floodwaters come out. They have sand and silk suspended in the water column and it moves out onto the floodplain. You get deposition directly adjacent to the banks of the river. It kind of builds up these shoulders, uh, if you will. Uh, abandoned channels and meanders like we saw in one of the first slides from the Sacramento River. Uh, crevasse blaze, which we're not going to really delve into too much today, but that's basically when the flood flows breach the natural levees and go out up deeper on in the floodplain and, and deposit material. But the main point is, is, you know, we can relate these um, basic processes to textures, right? So typically what happens is that, um, you know, you get sandy material that's associated with these little point bars and meander scrolls. You get uh, finer grain material with the sort of abandoned channel plugs. Uh, you can have some buried, um, basically, substratum uh, silts from uh, flooding, just basic flooding principles on the, on the floodplain. So, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all these, these things one by one, but the point is, is that we can relate the processes to the textures and the materials in the depositional environment and use those to help us anticipate or at least put a framework around the sediments the materials we're seeing in the shallow subsurface beneath the levee. So taking a little bit of a closer look at uh, this, this point bar meander scroll stratigraphy, right? So um, a point bar is just simply the inside of a meander bend. A meander scroll is quite simply an aggregation of a complex of point bars. So um, what we can see is that the, uh, oops, I'm giving it away. Oh, I've got to point it here. Sorry. So um, the meander scrolls and the point bars have a unique stratigraphy where essentially they have um, coarse material at the bottom and it kind of grades up to sand. And um, as the river meanders, you leave behind one point bar after another that accumulate into these meander scrolls. And the key thing is they leave behind this, this uh, characteristic ridge and swale morphology. Right, and so the ridges are a little sandier, they're a little coarser grained, and then these swales tend to be infilled with fine grain material. So you basically get horizontal permeability contrasts that can influence under seepage. 
So um, back in the 70s, the Army Corps of Engineers did some um, research work, basically um, as a result of the flood of 1955 on the Mississippi River. They did a lot of field work in terms of mapping where they had locations of under seepage, which are these red stars. And then they married that with the geomorphology. And essentially what they effectively uh, concluded is that these uh, Meander scrolls, these point bar uh, complexes, can strongly control the locations of under seepage where you have permeability contrast beneath the levee. So this would be the Mississippi River. This would be your levee. And these um, ridges and swales underlie the levee. So you can imagine, number one, if you were to go out and do a crest boring and a toe boring, you'd probably get two different things. You'd probably get more sandy material in the crest boring and more clayey material in the, in the toe boring. And, you know, there's a reason for that. So we should try and remember that, you know, when we see dichotomous materials at the same elevation on the subsurface, there's probably a reason for that. And it's because of this geomorphology. Um, and the other thing is, is that um, when we look at failure modes and BEP, one of the key nodes in the event tree is continuity of your materials. And if you just look at this sort of without the geomorphology, you would take sort of a levee perpendicular approach and you'd say, well, we don't have continuity because it's getting cut off by the clay, when in actuality you have an oblique continuity, right? So it's this three-dimensional spatial orientation that's critical to understanding how you would characterize that particular node in the subsurface. Just an example of real life. Uh, this is near Des Moines, Iowa. This is just a, an example. This is a LIDAR map. Um, I know it's a little hard to see because of the because of the glare, but essentially it's a lidar map that I've converted into two foot contours, and the river moves this way like that, and you can actually see these ridges and swales expressed on the floodplain today, right? So you'd have a levee that comes across, and it's overlying these materials. So this is this is more common than you would think. And so it's just the color-coded DEM just to kind of highlight these ridges and swales. You know, the, the yellow is the ridges, the blue are the swales. The levee actually comes down this way. This is kind of a degraded farmer's levee and goes up that way. Um, but just, just to, you know, hammer home the point that these exist and you can see them in the data that's publicly available. Again, this is just kind of tying together. Oops, that was just kind of tying together just textures and the depositional environments. Those slides should be in your packets. <clears throat> so really quick, uh, there's not just depositional relationships, there's erosional relationships. I'm gonna kind of hang on to this slide for a couple of seconds, because I think it's pretty important. Um, I try to do my best um, with putting this slide together, um, but let me just walk you through it really quick. So this is um, the Mississippi River flowing from north to south. Uh, this is the eastern floodplain. This is near uh, the south of St. Louis. I've done a lot of work out there on the St. Louis uh, levees for, um, for the Corps for many years now. And this is, this is again, this is an Illinois uh, Geologic Survey Public DEM, and it's beautiful. You can see, you can see these meander scrolls expressed on the floodplain today, even though they're, they're kind of farming it out. Um, and ignore this stuff. That's just background uh, white space filler. But the key thing is, is that we have a older terrace. So if you think of your Denison example from yesterday, you have an older terrace that's a little higher, and then you have next to it, you have a younger uh, terrace, young alluvium, that's directly adjacent to it, but at lower elevation. And the way that we get those sort of erosional relationships is by um, eroding and backfilling younger material against older. And when you look at it in a cross section, like if you were to take a cross section, you know, kind of, you know, across here or across here, um, you have your older terrace in orange and your younger alluvium lower in elevation directly next to it, right? So this is what we call an inset relationship. You'll hear this term a lot. The geologists should understand it. The geotechnical engineers should Try and pick this up because it, it makes a difference in terms of you know, how you see the subsurface stratigraphy. And if you just have this process model of inset relationships, you'll understand that you don't have lateral continuity across these uh, two terraces. And you can have an uh, older deposit coming underneath your younger deposit. 
right? So when I first started doing this with the core eight years ago, you know, it was a it, it was actually a um, big lift to try and get to people to be able to envision this sort of stratigraphic relationship. It is pretty important. You know, for one thing, you know, it can help you delineate, you know, reach boundaries as you go across older materials to younger materials from a from a levy risk assessment. It can help you understand why you're getting vertical discrepancies in your borings. It can help you understand why you're getting horizontal or lateral discrepancies in your borings. So it's a, it seems like a very simple thing, an erosional relationship, but um, it's actually a pretty powerful tool when we get to understanding our subsurface stratigraphy when we have a geomorphic framework. And then just finishing up a little bit on these erosional relationships, riverine erosion is also, you know, a kind of a big uh, failure mode. That was a, a really important one in Sacramento in 1996. They almost lost the levee from riverine erosion. And it's quite simply just the meandering of the, of the river through time. And, you know, the, the meandering of the river is continuous. You know, we try and think we can control rivers, but we can't. Even though we channelize them, they want to turn and bend. Um, and this, oops, this was just a, a cartoon on the top demonstrating just the process of riverine scour and levee failure. But, you know, even risk assessments today, you know, we do need to be aware of that because it's an ongoing process and you can be losing <laughs> Your, uh, your inner material, that's, um, this is what in, in New Orleans terms, they call this your batcher. Um, and loss of batcher is, is a bad thing for your uh, levy risk. So, you know, hopefully you've picked up a couple of things uh, as we've gone along um, in terms of what are the key processes for rivers, how they relate to the depositional environment, how that gets expressed on the floodplain and how we can um, understand that uh, together to come up with site models uh, for our risk assessments. So that's kind of the end of part one. Um, I'm just going to hang on for a second, see if anybody has any questions or wants me to kind of go through any other concepts. I was thinking about the risk assessments that I did early in my career in St. Louis when I was with the Corps, and um, one of the uh, facilitators that I had, you know, kept kept asking me, you know, okay, Justin, what does the geomorphology say? What does the geomorphology say, Justin? You know, and I and I was I was getting a little frustrated because I felt like I was getting picked on a little bit, you know, like he was trying to test me and stuff like that. But then I realized, you know. <laughs> It was more like that scene in Jerry Maguire where Jerry Maguire is talking to Rod Tillman and they're arguing and he says, help me help you. <laughs> it was help me help you. And you know, that's the way I want to see the interactions between the geologists and the geotechnical engineers in these risk assessments, right? You know, while I don't expect the geotechnical engineers to fully internalize and master all of this stuff, you should at least be able to have the ability to, to ask your geologist, what does the geomorphology say? And the geologist needs to be able to have an answer for that. And what happens is, is the communication part. How does the geologist and the geotechnical engineer come to a place where they're communicating on different levels, where one's talking about processes and the other one's talking about materials, come together to make an effective team or a risk assessment, you know, and it, and it was, it, it, and again, I just think of this, the scene where they're arguing back and forth, help me help you. And then Jerry McGuire gets so pissed, he's going to walk away. And Rod Tewell says, you think we're arguing, I think we're finally talking, you know. So ho hopefully if you don't get all the details, just come away with that sort of paradigm, right? That you guys need to be talking to each other to have an effective uh, characterization of your subsurface to understand particularly BEP. Uh, backward erosion and piping for your levy risk assessments.